And lastly, we have Brenda. Hello, Brenda. Take it away. Hi. My name is Brenda Laurel. I've worked in computer games and human-centered research for most of my career, and then in academia for 15 years. <laughs> I'm a queer woman married to a cis man. I'm a snorkeler, kayaker, trekker, trekky, Audrey, and nature lover, recently relocated to Santa Fe, New Mexico. This summer, I had to leave my home of 35 years in the Santa Cruz Mountains of Northern California. It was a place of huge trees, creeks, mountains, a wild abundance of critters and plants. The last enormous forest fire came within three miles of my home. And if the wind hadn't changed, fire would have swept up the canyon and consumed everything. Living in California, I became a bona fide tree hugger. And when you hug a big tree, you feel a huge, cool weightlessness coming from its heart. I feel great gratitude to Gaia for the enormous joy and peace I am afforded in the natural world. And Gaia, as you know, is a name for the whole. So in his famous Gaia hypothesis, James Lovelock proposed this. All organisms and their inorganic surroundings on Earth are closely integrated to form a single and self-regulating complex system, maintaining the conditions for life on the planet. Lovelock's work was supported by Lynn Margulis's breakthrough work in symbiosis and symbiogenesis. And their work was presaged by uh, Russian scientists in the late 19th and 20th century who could not yet bring evidence to bear. Now, Gaia still has an aura of woo-woo about it because it's named after a Greek goddess and associated with mythology and because the ideas behind the hypothesis were so radical at the time. But around the same time that Lovelock wrote that first paper, the notion of continental drift was considered fantasy by the scientific community. But then in the early 70s, evidence-based science changed everything. And today, continental drift is understood as scientific truth. Likewise, evidence-based studies have brought Gaian systems into the scientific, if not the public, mainstream. There's a bridge near a creek in a canyon near my old home where ladybugs come to mate in the fall. And the aggregation is so dense that nearby trees just drip with them. After the deed is done, adults head off to hibernate while the larvae develop into adults in about eight weeks. I remember one warm December day, Rob and I were down at Ladybug Bridge when the babies hatched and took flight, whirling and whirling off in all directions. Now, most gardeners know that ladybugs can break up the relationship between aphids and their tomatoes. Ants keep the aphids around to suck the good stuff out of the plant and feed it to them. So it's a kind of protection racket. Um, when ladybugs swoop in and eat the aphids, uh, the ants just find something else to do and an oscillating balance is maintained. Your tomatoes don't die. <laughs> this is a simple way to understand the symbiotic relationship among entities that is at the heart of Gaian systems. So the ant aphid ladybug relationship can be seen as an entity in itself. And it's nested within larger entities that include all the entities in the garden, the region, within Gaia itself. Like Russian dolls, it's nested entities all the way up and all the way down to mitochondria and transposons. Now gardeners and farmers who use organic or regenerative agricultural practices are in right relationship with a symbiotic balance. Industrial farming disrupts it. Slash and burn agriculture disrupts it. We can point the scientific 
But it's worth remembering that it wasn't until the 19th century that we were even aware of human causes of global warming. Now we know that our influence dates back at least 8,000 years to the practice of rice farming. But the folks who invented ancient agricultural practices couldn't have observed that, nor could they have imagined the enormous human footprint on the climate that the future would bring. I left California in a record setting year for wildfires. Causes included rising temperature, drought, increasingly severe lightning storms, and overabundance of brush. Now human activity and inactivity contribute to each of those causes. In the state park that bordered my former home, conservation was interpreted to mean non-intervention. So if a tree falls, let it rot there. If brush grows up and dries, leave it. It's nature's way. Well, no, not if we consider ourselves to be part of nature, of Gaia. We are in symbiotic relationships with forests and meadows. And that means our actions, as well as our inactions, count. As my indigenous friends remind me, colonial culture thinks of nature in terms of rights, and indigenous culture thinks in terms of responsibilities. Indigenous people in California and throughout the world have been acting symbiotically with forests for millennia through controlled burns, not only to avoid cataclysmic fires, but also to protect from damage to habitat for other species like salmon and redwoods. In California now, wildfire attenuation programs newly include active collaboration with indigenous people. Small, small burns in cooler months don't get out of control. They have a net negative carbon footprint because they safeguard the forest itself and its function as the carbon sink. So practices like this can be understood as Gaian gardening. That is to act in right relationship with the whole. Other examples of Gaian gardening abound from mangrove swamp restoration and vertical hydroponic urban agriculture. So this is my call to action. We have to live in right relationship with Gaia if our biosphere is to survive. This requires active propagation of an understanding of how Gaia works as a new center of gravity for our actions. Foremost, we need to take action in the polis, that is the cultural, social, and political contexts we live in. So a polis in the Greek sense is a city or a city state, but more broadly defined, a polis is a group of citizens that share common moral and ethical ground. So in that sense, we can already see a global collective of police that advocate for Gaian causes, from defenders of wildlife to climate 4.0. Each has its focus, from elephants to carbon neutral, low latency, high performance computing. But the laser-like focus of such police make them siloed from one another. As a first strategic action, we need to seek horizontal communication and common cause among these police. For example, in the early 20th century, the Democratic Party was shaped by alliances among interest groups as diverse as unionists, the Grange movement, and social justice advocates. They didn't all agree with one another on everything. There was no litmus test, but the clusters of meaning inherent in their interests and meaning clouds overlap to the extent that they were able to consolidate power into a greater polis that could exert large scale influence on political, cultural and civic life. I am not proposing a political party. I am proposing a political movement 
that consolidates and amplifies the power of the many polis working for the good. Working together, we will normalize a public guy and understanding of, a, of our world at a scale that can lead to real political change. So despite occasional victories for those advocating right relationship with Gaia, our established American polis has not succeeded in bending the curve towards Gaia and health. The ability to take right action rests on a polis that is set on solid moral and ethical ground, a polis that holds up right relationships with Gaia, and working together, we can do this. My husband often suggests that our legislature needs a speaker for the Redwoods. Far-fetched though this may sound, it is an example of how the form, power relations, symbols, and ceremonies of a new polis might be shaped by our consolidated efforts to propagate a conscious understanding of Gaian systems and to ground the actions that we take in consideration of the Gaian good. Let the redesign begin. Thank you. All right. Woo. Thank you, Brenda. Woo. You can unmute and clap for Brenda. Thank you, everybody. Woo. Woo. Um, right. Great. Well, that was... That was wonderful. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Brenda, sharing your story and uh, sharing that call to action. Um, and also, uh, thanks, to, thanks to all of our amazing speakers all around the world. Um, and a shout out to our documentarian, Jeremy Kamal Hartley, working in virtual space alongside our speakers real time. So we can unmute, give everybody a round of applause. Thank you. Yeah.